PhD in modern legal Japanese history, and now as an associate professor, teaches at Data University in Japan. He will address, among other things, the lack of academic freedom and censorship in American academia, which may perhaps explain in part why Japan is often attacked and anti-Israel activities spread in university campuses. Now, Dr. Morgan's talk will last about 40 minutes, followed by a Dr. Miroslav Marinov. And uh, I'll introduce Mr. Marinov, uh, Dr. Marinov uh, quickly. Dr. Marinov is a doctor of philosophy, a graduate of Sofia University and Bulgarian Academy of Science. Like most intellectuals living in communist rule, he came to North America to find a free society. However, he is alarmed to see the erosion of freedom and increasing censorship in Canada. Dr. Marinov spent some time writing political commentaries warning Canadians of this disturbing trend, often reporting on many local issues. Recently, his focus has been on research in a publication of two books, both on display in the back for sale, on the little known facts about the Holocaust. We asked Dr. Marinov to condense his talk to 30 minutes so that we have enough time for Q&A after both talks. And so, Dr. Morgan. Okay, thank you very much. Is it is it okay to take the microphone? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be associated with the Jewish Defense League and to be giving this talk. I also wanted to begin by thanking the Marinovs, um, Toshie and Miroslav for putting this together and also Sharon Isaac, who just gave me that kind introduction. I, I'm here on, uh, in, in Japan, I'm here on a katena schedule. I'm here uh, on my own terms, I guess you could say. I was, uh, I was suddenly, I suddenly decided to come to a conference in Michigan, and I had a standing invitation from, the, from Toshi and, and Miroslav. And I said, well, I can, I can come to Toronto after that. So here I am on a weekday. I came in this morning, and I was two hours late getting to the airport, and Toshiye-san drove around and, and, and picked me up, and she's been driving me all over the city, so I've been able to see Toronto for the first time. So this has been, this has been a study tour for me. Okay, um, I also wanted to thank Seido and Nokai for putting this together. Everyone who's come out in the middle of, of the week, and I know it's it's pretty cold outside. I noticed that as I was walking in. It's, it's not very warm. So everyone who's made the effort to be here, I very much appreciate it. Also, I should say, I was at that conference in Michigan, and I was supposed to talk for about 10 minutes about a paper, and I had some notes prepared. And when I got done with what I wanted to say, I realized that it had only been about three and a half minutes. And then I realized I hadn't really given a talk in English in a long time. And when I give a talk in Japanese, it takes a lot longer. So I might finish up a lot earlier than 40 minutes. I don't know. I have what I think will be 40 minutes worth of things to say. But I, I realized that I'm pretty good at speaking English. I just remembered that. So this, this, this might take a lot, a lot less time than I anticipated. OK. My, my talk is about the death of academic freedom. And I wanted to begin with, I wanted to pick up on, on something that Sharon said. When she was talking about these books about the rape of Nanking, the so-called rape of Nanking, or the comfort women, it's always the number that comes out. It's always 300,000 or 200,000. And if you go to the, the, the Nanking Memorial in China, it's the number. The number is inscribed. And whenever you hear about the comfort women, it's always 200,000, or recently it's been 400,000. The number, it's always the number that's emphasized. I spent a summer in Israel about maybe 10 years ago, and we went to Yad Vashem. 
And Yad Vashem, if I, if I understand correctly, means a memorial and a name. It's a name. The people there have names. They're human beings. It's not a number. The number's not written anywhere. It's people. There are photographs in the memorial. There are pairs of shoes. There are artifacts that were associated with individual people. Every effort has been made to find out who these people are. It's not a number. They're individual people. For me, that symbolizes the problem of academic freedom in the United States. And I don't know much about Canada. But the problem of academic freedom seems to me to be the problem of liberalism. And liberalism to me is the ideology that everything is the same, that every civilization is the same, that every religion is the same, that every, that every country is the same. One is as good as the other. I think that's the ideology of liberalism. But of course it doesn't work. Of course not every civilization is the same. If you've traveled to different places, you know that places are different. And what ha ends up happening with liberalism is it swiftly turns into dictatorship. In fact, I think liberals love dictators. In the United States, you find that the, the, the more liberal people claim to be, the more they love dictatorships. The people who claim to be liberals at Google and Facebook have been working with perhaps the worst dictatorship on the planet, the People's Republic of China, which is a murderous, oppressive, communist dictatorship. If you're a liberal and you claim to value every human life, how can you possibly be associated with the People's Republic of China? I think that it's not a coincidence. I think liberalism naturally tends to favor dictators. The worse dictator, the better. It's no coincidence that liberals love Fidel Castro, that they love, they love these strong men, because liberalism is an anti-human ideology. We are from certain places. We believe certain things. We're not all flat, as the liberals would like to imagine. And the only way to flatten people out is with violence. The only way to make everyone the same is to impose it upon them from the top. So I'd like to give a little bit of background about how I began to think about liberalism in this way, and why liberalism feeds into the death of academic freedom, and why that matters for Japan and for the United States, and also for Canada, I think. I've been learning about Canada recently from what's been happening in Japan. It's fitting, I think, that this talk is in Canada because I, I learned recently that your prime minister said of Canada that Canada has no core identity. I heard that he said that Canada has no core identity. And I thought, that hits a little bit close to home for the United States, too. In the United States, we take an oath to the Constitution. And we, when we put our hand over our hearts, we look at a, we look at a flag. We look at a, a piece of fabric. And I've begun to think recently, that's, a, that's not a very human thing to do, to, to, to pledge one's allegiance to a piece of paper or to sing a song to a piece of fabric that's tacked to a wall. That there must be some more human way to have a, a, a society. As I've gone around the world, I've found that there, there are different ways to organize a society than the liberal way, the one that I was used to growing up. So it's fitting, I think, that this talk is in Canada, because in many ways, Canada, for me, from what I've learned about it recently, represents the perils of liberalism, the dangers of liberalism, I think. You know, as we were walking through the mall just uh, an hour ago, Miroslav, you, you pointed out that what, what tends to happen is that there are little clusters of people and it becomes ghettoized, I think is the word that you used. And as you pass different tables, there are different people speaking different languages. And normally that's fine, but what happens is people bring their prejudices in from their old country and when they come to Canada, it, or when they come to the United States too, it just gets worse, it seems. You put people together, and it becomes obvious that some people are peaceful, but some people are not. And liberalism forces you to imagine everyone being nice and peaceful and happy, and it just isn't true. It simply isn't the case. Okay, so I'd like to interrogate that as we go along, this premise of liberalism. 
and how I began to question what liberalism is. I grew up as a good liberal, I suppose. I grew up in the south of the United States, in New Orleans, and we were told that our civilization was evil, that we came from an evil part of the world, and we had to uh, atone for what we had done in the past, that we had all done something wrong, and we were to be sorry for where we came from and what we had done. And then I went to Japan, and I began to see Japan in a good liberal way, which is that Japan should be sorry. Japan had done something horrible, and everyone in Japan should be sorry. And there was no way for Japan to atone for what it had done, but it should just keep on apologizing. That's the, that's the American way of looking at Japan. And then I read an essay, maybe about seven years ago, that completely changed my mind about, about this. A man named William Faulkner, he was a, a southern novelist. He went to Japan after the war with the State Department. And he gave a talk in Japan, I think he was in Nagano. And he said, my country lost a war to the Yankees too. We lost a war to the Americans too. And the Americans told us that we were bad that we had done something wrong. And they programmed us to believe that our civilization was inherently evil and that all we could really do was apologize for being from the South. And the same thing happened to you, he said. Wow, that's actually true. The Americans did the same thing to Japan that they did to us, that they did to the South, to the people in the South. And then I began to study what the Americans had done to Japan and to the South. In fact, some of the worst war crimes in American history were perpetuated by the Yankees. I don't know if I'm allowed to use that term in Canada. Is that okay? I guess for most people, Yankees is Americans. But for us, Yankees is people from the North. We're not Yankees. Maybe I should explain that. Yankees is not a, is not a term of endearment. I'm not using that as a compliment when I say Yankees. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a pejorative term. But the Yankees for us were always people from the north. And the Yankees, the, the Americans, did the same thing to Japan. They committed, they perpetuated atrocities and war crimes against Japan. And then they went to Japan and said, it was all your fault. We had to drop atomic weapons on your country. It was all your fault. In fact, they did the same thing to us. They didn't have atomic weapons at the time. But if they had had them, they would have used them. They definitely would have used them against Atlanta and New Orleans and Vicksburg. They most definitely would have used atomic weapons against the South. That's liberalism. Liberalism is a form of power. It's I'm correct and everybody else is wrong. That's what liberalism is to me. It's a form of leveling. It's a form of violence against other people. And then I, after I was in Japan, I went to the People's Republic of China. I lived in China for about six months, for one semester. And it was clear to me that Japan and China were not the same thing. The liberals will say that Japan and China are the same, that you should value all cultures, and that there's, you should be tolerant, and that you should celebrate diversity. OK. Somehow, in liberal cultures, there's never any diversity. Everyone is always supposed to think exactly the same way. Never mind. So I went to the People's Republic of China from Japan, and the difference in Japanese, we say unde no sa. It was the difference between the clouds and mud. It was a completely different place, Japan and China. And I couldn't bring myself to accept this liberal ideology that somehow Japan and China were the same, and somehow both were equally good. Because it clearly was not true. It clearly was not true. When I went to the post office in China, for example, everybody was asleep in the middle of the day. And I, need, I really needed a stamp. I needed to mail something. So I, I, sort of, I sort of tapped on the desk in front of one of the ladies who was asleep. And she woke up, and she was angry at me for waking her up from her, from her nap in China. And I thought, this, it, this in, in Japan, this is unthinkable. First of all, it's unthinkable they would be asleep. 
And then if I woke them up, that they would be angry at me for waking them up. That's, that's not the same. There's something strange about this liberal ideology. And then I went to Israel. And that completely changed my life. I was in Israel for, I guess it was, it was one summer. It was maybe two months or so that I was in Israel. I'll never forget this. We had a, a member of the Israel Defense Force come and speak to us about how they choose to engage in acts of defense when there are attacks on Israel. They agonize over human life. They agonize over whether they know that there's a terrorist inside of a building and they know that he's surrounded himself with children and old people. They know that he's sheltering in a kindergarten. And most of the time they will choose not to pursue the terrorist, even though they know who he is and where he is. They will choose not to attack him in order to spare innocent human life. Even though they know that by doing that, he will again attack Israel and kill Jews. Even though they know that he will do that, they will choose to spare human, innocent human life. The calculus is always in favor of sparing innocent human life. And then they took me to this, I was in Haifa. I was in Haifa in sort of the northern part of Israel. They took me to kindergartens and nursing homes. And the enemy had targeted those places. They had intentionally fired missiles at the kindergartens and the nursing homes in Israel. The opposite of what the Israeli army had done. The exact opposite. The Israeli army had agonized over how to save even one innocent human life on the enemy side. But the enemy was trying to kill as many innocent people as they possibly could in Israel. That was the whole point. Just kill as many people in Israel as you can. That was what they were trying to do. And I thought, this is, this is, it's not the same. It's not the same. There is no way to compare. There is no, it, it, it makes a mockery of comparison to say that these two things are the same. And so I began to question liberalism. What is this thing? What is liberalism? What is this thing that this ideology that drives all of our, our interactions in the West? Why do we cling to this thing? What is this idea of liberalism? Well, after I was in Israel, I went directly to graduate school. I came back from Israel and I entered the University of Wisconsin. And I don't know if you're familiar with the University of Wisconsin. It's a little bit like the Kremlin, except maybe further to the left. It's often called the Berkeley of the Midwest, but I would say that Berkeley is the Madison of California. University of Wisconsin-Madison is uh, a place where you can find actual card-carrying communists and Marxists and Maoists. I actually had two professors who are Maoists. Think about that, a Maoist someone who is an avowed follower of Mao Zedong, who thinks that he was a great guy and wants to imitate his methods, not just his ideas, his methods. These people were, oh, these are professors, openly saying Mao Zedong was a great guy and we should imitate Mao in the United States. What does that mean exactly? I asked one of them, I said, what does that mean? He said, overthrow capitalism. I said, okay, well, I'm looking around, I don't see anybody named capitalism, so how are you going to do that? Well, of course, it's violence. Well, I'm okay, thank you very much. Of course, it's violence. It's going out into the street and throwing Molotov cocktails and starting fires and killing people. That's how you do that thing that he's trying to, that he's, that he's advocating. That, to me, that is, the very fact that that person has a job teaching in the United States is incredible to me. How is that possible? How are parents paying for a Maoist to educate their children and how to overthrow capitalism? Okay, that's the beginning of the death of academic freedom, to my mind. So I'm gonna give you a little background on how academic freedom does not work in the United States. When I went to Japan, people would tell me that their image of the United States was a place where all opinions are welcome, where you can say whatever you want. You have freedom. You can stand on the street corner and say whatever you like. That is absolutely not the case. And I'm getting the sense that it's not the case in Canada either, that you can't say whatever you want 
You don't have freedom of expression. In the United States, we have this Bill of Rights, which has been completely torn to shreds over the past 250 years. There are no, there's no more, there's no more freedom of expression. Try it if you want. I don't have a Twitter account, but if, if you do, go on Twitter and try to speak the truth and see how long that lasts. People get kicked off of Twitter all the time. In fact, there was a Canadian woman, uh, Megan Murphy, I think is her name. Are you familiar with? I think it's Megan Murphy. She was banned from Twitter for saying that men cannot be women. I think she wrote on her Twitter account, a man cannot become a woman. I, I'm pretty sure that's what she wrote. And she was banned from Twitter for writing this. And she was, what she was saying was a biological fact. If you, even if you try to have these operations, it's basic cellular biology, it's, it's DNA, it's, it's, it's in the genes. You can't, it, it just doesn't, doesn't work. So she's saying something that's scientifically true and she was kicked off of Twitter. That's freedom in the United States. That's how academic freedom works. Okay, in my own case, in my own experience, what have I seen in terms of academic freedom. All right. As Sharon kindly mentioned, I had the, the honor of translating this book by Hata Sensei on the comfort women. The comfort women, what are the comfort women? It was about four or five years ago and I was at Wasada, Wasada University in Japan. And I had been in fights with my department over a variety of things. One of them was diversity training. Before I left for Wasada, it was in 2013. Everyone was to have diversity training. What is diversity training? It's brainwashing. Diversity training is just pure brainwashing. Before I became a, an assistant to one of, it was actually the Maoist professor, I was his assistant, that's funny. I was his teaching assistant. And before I could become his assistant, I had to have training. And so we go to this diversity training. And I was like, oh no, I I know it's coming, I know what this is all about. But I went to the first session, and I sat there, and then we were given a, a handout to work with. And the first line of the first page was, all white people are racist. And okay, well that's one way to start a conversation, I suppose. And I got angry at this. I thought, this, how dare you? And actually there was someone sitting next to me from Uganda, and he leaned over and he said, why? Why are they doing this? This is a man from Africa who is very troubled by this clearly racist diversity training. And so I protested about this. I said, look, if all white people are racist, we should all just resign immediately. If you really think this is true, we should not be working here. And so I, I challenged the professors working in the department, all the white people, I said, we should all resign en masse and walk away. If what, if what you are saying is really true, we have no business teaching here. We're completely disqualified from being in this university. All white people are racist, so let's all go home. They said, no, 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 we, we can't do that. We don't really mean all white people are racist. So I think what they really meant was just me. I'm pretty sure that's what they had to say. So I've been fighting them over this indoctrination for a while. So I knew what they were like. And then I went to Wasada, and things were calm for a bit. And then, two political activists, one of them had been, in, had been in Toronto recently, I think. Her name is Alexis Dutton. She's a professor at the University of Connecticut. And the other is Jordan Sand. He's a professor at the University of George, Georgetown University in Washington, DC. At the Association for Asian Studies conference, they started a petition which was a political attack against Prime Minister Abe of Japan. And at first they got 19 people to sign this thing, which was saying that Japan should apologize for the comfort women, should apologize for the atrocities of the past. Japan has apologized for the comfort women dozens of times. If, if you want to see the number of apologies for the comfort women, you can, you can find them. They've apologized for, endlessly for the comfort women. But we need another apology for the comfort women. Okay. So it went from 19, and then it went to 187, and eventually it's more than 500 people who signed this letter, this open letter to the Prime Minister of Japan. It was a clear political attack by a member of the American Academy. And I wrote a letter in protest to the Association of, uh, the American Historical Association. 
said, this is not right. You can't, this cannot be. You cannot have American academics engaging in, in cheap politics like this. You can't, this, this can't, this can't be. And anyway, the American Academy is a place where only one opinion is accepted. So how can you possibly criticize the prime minister of another country for cracking down on academic freedom when you don't practice it yourself? It's like this woman, AOC. Have you followed American news? AOC? The, the Green New Deal, but she flies around in airplanes and her staff is eating hamburgers and she's telling everyone else to conserve on fossil fuels, but she's jet setting all over the all over the northern hemisphere in this big old plane burning burning fossil fuel. It's the same in the American universities. It's always academic freedom for me, but not for thee. We have academic freedom, we being the leftist, but everybody else doesn't. Your opinion is not welcome. And I know that for a fact, and I'll tell you why. After the comfort women issue broke with this Alexis Dudden letter, I began to think, this is very strange. What they're saying is strange. Because I have been in Japan now for, I've been doing research here for almost a year, and I've been studying with these two professors at Waseda University, and everything that I have seen indicates that when Japanese researchers do scholarship, they begin with the documents and they end with the documents. They don't bring ideology into their scholarship. Some people do, of course. There are some radical feminists and there are some Marxists. There's Karatani Kojin, who is a Marxist. There are some radicals who use ideology. But almost every researcher I have studied starts and ends with the documents. They don't bring preconceived notions to the table. They do actual scholarship. They actually research things on paper. They don't, they don't, they don't, it's not a figment of their imagination. So I said, this is very strange. They're attacking these people for making this stuff up. It's not possible. These Japanese researchers are extremely careful and conscientious. They would not manufacture this myth of 200,000 sex slaves being dragooned out of their villages by the Japanese military. If this really existed, there would be documentary evidence. And someone that I respect, like Hata-sensei, would not be saying, no, no, this did not happen. These people don't deal in myths and fantasies. Hata-sensei is a careful, conscientious scholar. And Hirakawa-sensei, Hirakawa Tsukehiro, He's another person who was saying, this, this is not true. And so I was thinking, what, what's going on here? Why are all the Americans saying that you're apologizing for war crimes and all the Japanese scholars are saying, you got it all wrong? I began to research it. And I realized that the Japanese side was actually correct. That there were no 200,000 sex slaves forced out of their villages by the Japanese military. It's completely bogus, it's a lie. It's all a lie. And so I wrote this little letter and said it's all a lie, and you know it's a lie, and I can tell you why it's a lie, because you don't let any other opinions into the American Academy. Well, American, American liberals, I don't know, maybe it's different in Canada, American liberals don't have much of a sense of humor. <laughs> they, they don't really find things funny, especially irony. Even when something is dripping with irony, they just don't get it. And so I wrote this letter of protest saying, why are you shutting down other opinions? And about two days later, my thesis advisor, my PhD advisor, sent me an email and said, I'm not your advisor anymore. She didn't say why. She just said, she said I'm busy. I'm busy. OK. I'm busy. I'm busy, too. I didn't know that that was an excuse. I'm busy. The irony of my protesting, they're shutting down other opinions, and their response to that is to shut down other opinions and say, I'm not your advisor anymore. Okay. So then I went back to the United States, and I finished the thesis by the grace of God, and I got out of there. I was very happy to leave. I've, I've left singing a song. I was like, thank God I'm done with Madison, Wisconsin. I'm never coming back. <laughs> and then I got to my university where I am now. It's a very nice university in Japan. I'm, I'm very grateful to be there. And a few months later, I got this anonymous letter with a copy of a recommendation letter. Recommendation in scare quotes, recommendation letter. 
in which my second advisor, who is Alexis Dutton's friend, by the way, Alexis Dutton, she thanks Alexis Dutton in her PhD thesis. My second advisor wrote me this recommendation letter for a job in which she said that I was whitewashing history for Abe. In the recommendation letter, a job recommendation letter, she said that I am whitewashing history for Abe, so be careful of this guy, what she said. He, he deserves special attention, she said, special attention, because I'm whitewashing history. I thought, wow, this, this is something. This is how it works. If you have a different opinion, you're blacklisted and you're out. They just run you out, and they don't care. They have no shame about it. So I thought, okay, I, okay. I thought about this for a while. I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with this? I actually thought about suing them. Actually, I thought about suing. My grandfather was a lawyer, so I'm always thinking of suing someone. Who am I going to sue? I thought, okay, I'm going to sue them. But then if I sue them, then it makes it seem that I didn't want the job that I have now. I would have to claim damages. Well, I don't really have any damages. I like the job that I got. So I don't want to sue them. I'll just pour sunshine into this dark corner. So I decided to make known to the world what had happened. Okay. So I thought, how am I, gonna, how am I going to counter this comfort women myth? So I, I had gotten to know Hata Sensei, and he very kindly asked me to be part of this translation project. And finally, the book was finished, the book came out, and there's a little uh, alumni news section of the website of the University of Wisconsin-Madison History Department. And so I said, this will be fun. I'm going to put some alumni news up. I'm going to tell them that I published the English language translation of the Hata Sensei book on the comfort women. Let's see what they do with that. So I went to the alumni news section. I put the link to the, the book on Amazon. And I wrote a little blurb saying, Morgan has translated this book that counters bias in the American Academy. Well, lo and behold, the little intern, the little undergrad who works at, this, at the office, she posted it as is. God bless her. She put the thing up just as I had written it. It was beautiful. It was a complete slap in the face to the biased people at the, at the University of wisconsin Madison. And of course, within about 24 hours, they'd taken it down. They, they took it down. The irony, I'm telling them you're biased and you're censoring other opinions, and what do they do? They take down the criticism that says you're biased and censoring other opinions. Okay. So then, I wrote them an email and said, what's going on? I'm, I'm sort of playing coy. I said, what, what's going on? What, what happened to this? What happened to my advertisement? And they said, oh, well, we're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> technical difficulties, you're right. So I sort of string them along a little bit and say, well, well, well when is it going to be posted? Oh, we're working on it. We're working on the process. Okay. So I kept emailing them and trying to, what I was trying to do is start an internal conversation. Because we have a law in the United States called the Freedom of Information Act. It was passed back in the 1960s. Maybe you have the same thing in Canada. I was trying to generate internal traffic so that I could use FOIA to get the emails to see what they were talking about when, when they were talking about censoring, because I knew that's what they were doing. And so I finally got the emails. And sure enough, the emails were a blow-by-blow blow account of how they panicked. They said, well, oh, we, 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 can't, we can't post this, but we can't not post this, because we, we, we're going to get in trouble if we don't. So we got to post it, but we can't, we can't post it as, we, as he wrote it, because that makes us look bad. They completely rewrote the thing. They had, uh, they had other alumni news in which someone had written an article calling Trump a white supremacist. And they posted that exactly as is, but mine they, they revised. And so I found the email showing that they, had, that they had censored this material that I wrote. And so I, I thought, you know, this, this FOIA thing could be interesting. I want to see what we can do with this FOIA thing. And so I branched out on the FOIA thing. I started to FOIA David Kay's emails. You remember David Kay? David Kay is the, the UN Special Rapporteur. He works at the University of California, Irvine. He's a clinical professor of law. He was selected by the United Nations to do an investigation of academic freedom, freedom of expression in Japan. 
And he issued a report a few years ago which said that there's no freedom of expression in Japan. If you remember this guy, David Kay, right? David Kay. Who is this guy, David Kay? He doesn't speak Japanese. He'd never been to Japan as far as I know. He doesn't study Japan. Why would they choose this guy? He's a clinical professor of law, which is pretty much the lowest rank at a law school. This UC Irvine, which is not a big school. How did this guy get chosen? When David Kay came back from Japan, he gave precisely one public appearance. And there was one other person on the stage with him. Can you guess who it was? Alexis Dutton. Alexis Dutton. So I thought, I wasn't born yesterday. I know what's going on here. So I emailed David, I, I, I FOIA his, his emails. And I found out that sure enough, Alexis Dutton had been coaching David Kay over which voices to listen to and which voices to ignore while he was writing his report in Japan. For example, conservative people inside of Japan, or just pro-Japanese people in general, would send David Kay an email and say, look, I know you're doing this report. I'd like to meet with you. I'd like to send you some information so that you don't get just one side. And he would immediately forward that to Alexis Dunn. And she would say, no, they're conservative. Just ignore them. And it seems that he did. Or they're right wing. Just ignore them. And it seems that she did. That's academic freedom in the United States. You have complete freedom to destroy anyone who is not a leftist. But if you are not a leftist, you have no freedom. You have no freedom of expression. Try it. Try it. If you're not President Trump, everybody else goes to jail. If he was not the president, his Twitter would be gone in a minute. He would be out. There's no freedom of expression left in the United States. You have to, you have to go almost Sami's dot. It's like you have to send secret underground handwritten copies of your manuscript in order to get people to read them. Freedom of expression is dying in the United States. And I think it's because the United States has become a completely liberal country. Liberal is the same word as freedom, but it's the opposite of that. If you want freedom of expression, you have to go to a place like Japan. Now this is interesting. This is really interesting. There was a man and um, I think it's Yuval Hazoni. He wrote a book called Nationalism. You might have read it. it. Came out last year. His argument, and I think he's right, is that the nation state is the wave of the future. Is it right? It's not globalism. It's not transnational liberalism. It's the nation state. You have to be from somewhere in order to interact with other people. You can't be a citizen of the world. You gotta be from somewhere, you gotta be somebody. You have to have some belief, you have to believe something. You have to be a patriot of some kind. You have to be, you have to have allegiance to something. You can't be a globalist, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as globalist unless you mean a, an international bank robber, which is pretty much all that you get with globalism. That's what it was from the beginning. I think he's on to something. And I think in Japan, that's the key to maintaining freedom. I feel free in Japan in a way that I don't in the United States anymore. I've, I'm sh shocked, appalled, saddened by what's happened to my country. My parents tell me about it all the time. You can't say anything anymore. You can't say, Maybe we shouldn't have this group of people coming in here and murdering people. You can't say that because, of course, you're a racist. If you say maybe you shouldn't have criminals coming in and murdering people, it makes you a racist somehow. You can't say that maybe there should be some sort of standard. Maybe you should have some sort of rule of law and not just gangsterism in the United States. That maybe there should be some sort of government accountability and not a coup d'etat by the FBI. You can't say that anymore. Look what happens if you say that. Look what happened to Roger Stone. Did you see what happened to him? Yeah. They sent federal agents to his house. They sent more federal agents to arrest him than they sent to, ke to catch Osama bin Laden. That gives you an idea, that's literally true. That gives you an idea of what the deep state is afraid of. They're afraid of people who speak out, who speak their mind. You gotta be from somewhere. 
This may be controversial, I don't know. I don't know if people here will agree or disagree. I remember being in Israel, and I was at the, I think it was the King David Hotel, and I might have, I might have the building name wrong. There was a place where it had been bombed by a man named Jabotinsky. And I remember thinking, people were criticizing the Zionists, right? They're saying that the Zionists were, that they were wrong. And I remember thinking, I remember walking by the building and thinking, I don't agree with the bombing, but if this was my country, I would probably do the same thing. This is our country. It doesn't belong to the English. It belongs to the Jews. This is ours. This is worth fighting for. And the same in Japan. This is, Japan is Japan, the country of the Japanese people. It belongs to them. And to be from somewhere is the key to freedom, I think. If I am somebody, if I'm from somewhere, I can easily interact with people from other countries. It's easy to do. I know that they have their own allegiances and I have mine. And we can sort it out as individuals. But if we're from nowhere, if everybody is from nowhere, if everybody is nobody, then all you got left is just pure political power that, that flattens everything and keeps everybody in line. That to me is academic freedom, the true academic freedom that I feel in Japan. It's a function, I think, of being from somewhere. Now, to lead, I think, into Miroslav's talk, he's going to talk about the myth of the Asian Holocaust. The one thing that the Japanese people do not understand, is the same that the Americans don't understand, is that we are in a war. There's a war. It's time to wake up. This comfort women thing has gotten me to understand that it's not about the comfort women, it's not about Nanking, it's about information war. And who's running this information war? Why? Why is Japan being attacked? Why? Why are they building comfort women st statues in countries all over? Why are they putting them in San Francisco? Why is San Francisco? Diane Feinstein, the senator from California, her husband is friends with Jiang Zemin. They've been buddies forever. If you ask Diane Feinstein about Tiananmen, she will say, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe some people were hurt. I don't know. She will completely downplay Tiananmen Square. The person who was a spy, who was her driver for more than 20 years, was a PRC spy. And the FBI found out about it. And he's still in the country. He's still in the United States. And do you know where he went after he had to leave Feinstein's office? He went to the organization that brought the Comfort Woman statue to San Francisco. It's war. It's not just some scholars writing letters to the editor about the Prime Minister of Japan. It's information war. And the Comfort Women, the Nanking, and BDS. I fought these people when I was in University of Wisconsin-Madison. BDS, these people are the worst. These people pretend to be in favor of Palestine. They just hate Jews. They just hate Jewish people. They had rallies at the University of Wisconsin. I actually sent their emails to the, uh, the Anti-Defamation League. I would forward their emails. I would say that th th these people are not, this is not pro-Palestine. This is just anti-Israel. This is just anti-Jewish. This is information war. The bad guys are fighting the good guys. It's a function of not everybody being the same, not everything being the same, in my honest opinion. So my message today, I think, is uh, fight back. Fight back. You don't, you don't have to take it. You can fight back. You can get their emails. You can be crafty. You can maneuver. You can, you can be stealthy. They don't hurt anybody, but you can you can go on the attack. You can go on offense against these people. It's the PRC, for goodness sake. It's the People's Republic of China. They're bad guys. And it's time to fight back. Thank you for your time. Can you hear us? I want to start with the remark that Jason made about the importance of documents and the uh, uh, real uh, coverage of history uh, that uh, is uh, 
so important without uh, considering those documents, we cannot have a, a proper understanding what uh, happened in a certain period of time. So the focus of my uh, presentation will be the Holocaust. And uh, uh, there are some problems that I wasn't aware a few years ago uh, when I wasn't uh, that deeply involved in those issues. But uh, when I decided to start uh, writing a book about uh, certain events of the Holocaust, uh, specifically in Europe and uh, Asia, uh, I uh, became aware of uh, how much uh, things uh, distorted in history. And that uh, uh, after uh, like a contemplation about uh, how these things were, uh, I uh, basically uh, had the a kind of revelation, something that uh, even that period of uh, history is uh, deeply influenced by ideological uh, problems and agendas that uh, force certain people to ignore important facts or to distort them. And this is not just the revisionists who flatly deny that the Holocaust happened. This is uh, also uh, happening in the official establishment uh, history of the Holocaust. So th that is important uh, to remember uh, when going through all the archives and finding documents that uh, are very unusual and uh, are not quoted or mentioned often. So the, the, uh, the idea of the, uh, the, the Holocaust, that somehow it uh, came with the evil will of uh, one person, Adolf Hitler, is uh, not uh, exactly what uh, happened. That Hitler uh, copied many of the ideas that he applied from uh, very common and uh, widely spread uh, ideas at the time, like uh, the eugenics, the racial purification, and uh, they are very uh, common and uh, accepted in, by in the mainstream. And uh, all these ideas of eugenics, for example, lobotomy and uh, uh, the uh, steriliz forced sterilization, they were uh, practiced in the Scandinavian countries long after Hitler was gone. So when we uh, consider the history of the Holocaust, we should remember uh, that. And uh, the, the other thing is that uh, the simplification uh, goes to uh, show, for example, that the Western Europe and uh, the countries in Western Europe, uh, the noble countries that uh, eventually defeated the Holocaust and Hitler, while the other countries were not that uh, noble, uh, did little, which is also not true. Uh, I, I just want to give you an example of that uh, complicated issue with the story of uh, uh, Jewish refugee. I learned about her when I visited uh, the town of Tsuruga in Japan. Uh, that is the uh, town where thousands of refugees landed, uh, Jewish refugees, uh, in the period of 1940-1941. Uh, so uh, her, her name was uh, Masha Leon. Uh, she was a journalist uh, for Forward, the New York newspaper, until her death in uh, 2017. So uh, the uh, Masha uh, had a fam family who lived in, uh, in Poland. Uh, at the time, she was 10 years old. When uh, the, the Germans and the Russians attacked Poland from both sides, uh, her father was arrested by the Russians and uh, sent to jail as a Zionist. So the, uh, the mother and the daughter found themselves in the German-occupied part of Poland. So they wanted to uh, leave, and you know, the safest way was to go to Lithuania, which was uh, still an independent country. So they uh, hired a Polish uh, peasant who promised to uh, get them to the border, and they had to pay him, of course. But instead of the border, they, he took them uh, immediately to the uh, German military unit in the area. So the, both of them were arrested by the, the Germans, and the commander uh, gave uh, everybody who was uh, arrested that day, there were about 30 people, numbers. 
from uh, 1 to 30 and uh, told them to keep the numbers uh, until the next morning. The next morning, the, the Germans shot uh, everybody who had the uh, even number. Be and uh, Masha and her mother both had the uh, odd numbers, so they, they survived and uh, the Germans let them go. Uh, on their way from the, uh, from the uh, German unit, they uh, met uh, a certain woman who was an uh, uh, Orthodox Christian and she took them to the border where, uh, and she didn't uh, take any payment for that. At the border, the Russians uh, uh, threatened them with uh, uh, arrest because they are crossing illegally. But when uh, one of the guards uh, heard that uh, the name of the girl was Masha, uh, he, he realized that's uh, the name of his uh, little sister. So instead of uh, arresting them, they took them to the military barracks and they had a, there was a party with the vodka and uh, rye bread. Then they were released and sent uh, to Lithuania. They had no problem. In Lithuania, they uh, managed to get visas, uh, transit visas to Japan from Chuni Sugihara, who was the, the consul at the time. And from there, they took the uh, Trans-Siberian uh, Express to go to Vladivostok. From Vladivostok, they boarded the Japanese uh, ship uh, that uh, took them to Tsuruga. From um, Tsuruga, they managed to reach Kobe, which is a city with a small Jewish community. And uh, they, they were helped uh, with accommodation and food by uh, Japanese and uh, also uh, Jewish charities. And because the, the visas, the transit visas, valid for only about uh, two, two weeks, uh, they, uh, the Japanese government uh, periodically uh, renewed them and extended the visas for about a year until they uh, managed to immigrate to Canada. Once in Canada, uh, the mother and Masha were told not to mention uh, to anybody, the authorities told them that, that they were treated well in Japan. And uh, Masha had a, a friend in Canada, a Japanese girl whose uh, uh, family was interned during that, you know, that internment of the Japanese during the war. And she was ostracized because of that uh, friendship by uh, the other Canadians. After the war, uh, the uh, Masha mother was supposed to be sent back to Poland because they were Polish citizens. And Masha, she was 13 at the time, wrote a long letter to Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, where she said that she wanted to immigrate to the United States and she explained the why. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt read that letter and she intervened on their behalf and they managed to get uh, into the United States. So uh, the, the point of the, this story is that uh, the, the event that happens are very complex. Like uh, certain uh, groups and uh, certain people act in a way that uh, is not expected uh, from them. So uh, when we uh, really want to restore the uh, real history of the Holocaust and who did good and who did bad, uh, it, it's important to consider all the facts. So from that point of view, uh, I want to quote you an article that uh, appeared uh, earlier, not like it was actually last month, in uh, Jerusalem Post, and it uh, concerned uh, Chunya Sugihara, the uh, very well-known uh, Council of Japan in Lithuania, who provided visas to many Jews. So I, I've got, uh, it's a very short article, I've got two paragraphs. Uh, okay, Sugihara was uh, Japan's ambassador to Lithuania in 1940 when the Germans invaded the country. Uh, Jews came to the Japanese consulate in the hope of uh, obtaining visas to escape the Nazis. The Japanese government denied Sugihara's request to grant them visas, but he decided to disobey the order and grant them uh, anyway. He was able to print and stamp over 2,000 family visas on which uh, multiple people could travel before he was forced to leave Kaunas, at that time the Lithuanian capital. According to witnesses, he kept uh, writing 
uh, business on his way to the train, and when he ran out of time, he threw paper stamped with the consulate seal and his signature on the train window, out of the train window, so that the refugees and their, uh, the following crowd could write the business on their own. Once he returned to Japan, he was fired by the government for disobedience, end of quote. Okay, there's only two short paragraphs, but there are many half-truths and uh, distortions uh, in them. And I uh, wrote uh, to, uh, to the Jerusalem Post with a rebuttal, but uh, as of this uh, moment, they neither uh, acknowledged it nor published it. So uh, the, the, the things are, uh, again, much uh, more different than the, the real, uh, than, than what uh, was written in that article. Uh, you, sh you should remember that uh, Japan, uh, despite of being an ally of uh, Germany, had a totally different uh, policy on the Jewish question. Uh, for example, uh, the Kristallnacht in uh, November 1938, uh, everybody knows what, what happened then. That was the first uh, extreme atrocity in Germany. Uh, the Japanese government, uh, about three weeks later, uh, issued an official statement uh, uh, stating that uh, the Jews will, will not be persecuted or mistreated in any way on the territory of the Japanese Empire. And, and that's what the, the policy was. Uh, the same year, 1938, uh, there was a large group of uh, Jews on the northern border of Manchuria, which was occupied by Japan at the time. Uh, they were on the, the Soviet side, about 20,000 people. And they were stranded, and the uh, Stalinist authorities uh, were threatening them with uh, deporting or sending them to camps. And uh, that, that large group of uh, Jews were allowed uh, into Manchuria by the army commanders of uh, that uh, area. So, uh, the, the other thing is that uh, uh, Sugihara wasn't actually uh, banned from uh, issuing the visas. The, the Japanese bureaucracy, which is notorious for its uh, inaction in many important cases, uh, simply was, was reluctant to deal with so many foreigners coming into the country. And it, uh, the, uh, another uh, issue that uh, is important to mention is that uh, Sugihara is always presented as some kind of a lone hero who uh, acted against the government. And uh, uh, that, that uh, changed, uh, he changed. Because the big problem is uh, when you consider that uh, the visas he issued were uh, like uh, designed to let people into Japan. So the Japanese government would always reject those visas. But uh, the government never rejected or annulled any of the visas. And uh, in, in the article, uh, it was mentioned how uh, he uh, gave to the refugees black papers and they filled them out. Technically, those were invalid visas. And uh, when the Japanese authorities saw that uh, when the, on the ship that was coming to Tsuruga, in the first uh, such encounter, they uh, returned about 100 refugees to Vladivostok because the, the visas were not good. But uh, the Russians uh, threatened that they'll send them to camps in Siberia. So Japan took them back and they never questioned any of those visas. And uh, uh, in the case of uh, Sugihara, he uh, issued about 2,000 of those visas. But uh, another important fact is that many other consuls in uh, Japan, in Europe, uh, issued similar visas. Uh, there is some information here that uh, between January 1940 and mid-March 1941, uh, Japanese consulates in uh, Europe issued transit visas to 5,580 people. And the Kaunas consulate of uh, Sugihara was the source of more than 2,000 visas. The remaining visas were issued by the consular uh, offices in Berlin, Moscow, Vienna, Hamburg, Stockholm, Prague, Sofia, and Riga. So 
that there are much more activity uh, on the behalf of Japan than uh, the Sugihara. And the, the other uh, thing about him being fired for that, uh, it's another important fact is that uh, he was uh, arrested after the, uh, after the war as an enemy uh, combatant. And uh, from 1945 to 1947, he spent uh, uh, two years in the, uh, some uh, camp, American rat camp in Europe. So uh, when he came back to Japan, the, the Ministry of uh, the Foreign Affairs was basically decimated because uh, Japan didn't have uh, its own policy under American occupation, and the, the majority of the employees were purged. Uh, besides, uh, Sugihara at the time was uh, 47 years old, uh, while the, the retirement age in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was 50. So the things are, again, they're much more complicated. Uh, the, the same uh, thing is, uh, uh, we can see the same uh, distortion uh, when you uh, go into the saving of the Jews in Bulgaria, which is another well-known fact. But uh, often the uh, actions of Bulgaria, uh, like a, belittled by the, the Western powers, the, the Western, the West European establishment. And uh, as, a, as some kind of a, a moral uh, superiority, uh, always uh, they, they mention Denmark as a, a country that uh, did so much uh, for its Jews, while uh, Bulgaria did uh, all the, some things, but they all were wrong uh, incomplete and something like that. So uh, let me give you just a few uh, facts about uh, what uh, actual, uh, the actual record of Denmark is. Uh, it, it is a, <coughs> a fact which is uh, proven that uh, Denmark in uh, 1940 surrendered to Germany and uh, adopted uh, a policy of collaboration uh, which allowed the king and the uh, uh, government to keep their positions. And uh, there, is a, there are a few uh, facts about uh, uh, Denmark was uh, a significant uh, uh, supplier for agricultural products for Germany. And uh, the Danish military provided to the Wehrmacht uh, 60,000 rifles and bayonets, almost 1,000 machine guns, mortars and munitions. Over 140,000 Danes were recruited in Germany as paid foreign workers. The Danish industry supplied to Germany military boats and other ships. The Danish army was in charge of the fight against saboteurs, partisans, and traitors, which in other occupied countries was the job of the Germans. And 2,000 Danes were working for the Luftwaffe uh, directly. The worst part was that uh, uh, Denmark provided 6,000 men who joined the Waffen-SS on the Eastern Front. And they were uh, united with the Norwegians uh, and the Swedes and the uh, people from Iceland. And they uh, took part in extermination of the, uh, the Jewish population in uh, uh, Thermopol and Zlochow. About uh, 3,000 Jews were killed by, by that unit. And uh, uh, the documents say that the, the, that massacre in Zlocha specifically was stopped by a German Wehrmacht officer who was shocked by the cruelty and the methods of uh, execution used by the Ukrainians and the Scandinavians. Because the Ukrainians also uh, had a uh, significant participation in that. So the the, the, the problem is that, uh, again, you have to uh, take into account every, every fact. And all these uh, uh, inconvenient facts were not uh, known until the late 1990s. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, fact is that in 1946, uh, in Denmark, somebody published the, a book with the uh, names of the 28,000 members of the Danish Nazi party. That was after the war. The, the book was immediately banned, and it uh, remains secret until today. 
And uh, when we go even uh, the higher level to those uh, great powers who are credited with uh, helping the Jews uh, during the Holocaust, we uh, still can find the facts that are not exactly uh, up to uh, the, the pretentious uh, uh, ideas they have about uh, their role. Uh, everybody knows that uh, in 1920, the San Remo Conference created the, uh, the Mandate for Palestine and then uh, the League of Nations uh, entrusted uh, Great Britain with preparing that uh, area for the future Jewish state. But uh, Great Britain mismanaged spectacularly the, the whole uh, mandate by uh, uh, ceding big territories to the Arabs, allowing uncontrolled uh, Arab immigration. And uh, uh, the, the worst part for the war, during, just before, uh, during the start of the war, was the so-called uh, white paper, which uh, blocked, uh, practically blocked the immigration of Jews to Palestine, which was supposed to be their country. And then, uh, Another document which is not uh, publicized very, very much is a, a memo which covers a meeting of uh, President Roosevelt, his uh, uh, Secretary of State Cordell uh, Hull, and uh, Sir Anthony Eden, who was the Foreign Minister of uh, England. So it dealt with the, the future of uh, Palestine. Uh, the British uh, claim that uh, the, the Palestine has reached its absorption uh, limit, which was uh, uh, a place that uh, 500,000 Jews. They said that, it, uh, the, that uh, land cannot sustain any more people. And that the Jews, uh, that 500,000, shouldn't uh, also uh, exceed the number of the Arabs there to which uh, Roosevelt agreed. And uh, they planned, that, was, uh, that meeting was planned to abandon the political uh, uh, future of Palestine as a Jewish state and turn it into uh, uh, some entity which will be ruled by a, a religious council. So, and, and here is what they, uh, they say that uh, considering that, uh, because there are three major religions in Palestine, and considering that uh, there are in the world some 585 million Christians, 220 million Muslims, and 15 million Jews, the body might have a membership, that's the governing body of the Palestine, membership of six, consisting, consisting of three Christians, two Muslims, and one Jew. And uh, the Jewish position was supposed to be uh, a rotating one, uh, occupied by a Zionist, non-Zionist, and anti-Zionist. So that they practically abandoned the whole thing. Uh, and uh, during the, the, the war, different uh, attempts were made to uh, save uh, the Jews because, uh, uh, despite the fact that uh, it's often claimed that many of the Western powers didn't know what was going on in Europe. Uh, there are very uh, clear indications that uh, they uh, knew. Uh, for example, in the, that was in March in the 1943. There was a request from Bulgaria uh, to uh, give to allow 60 to 70,000 Jews uh, residing in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, there was uh, about 48,000 Jews, so that probably included the, the Jews in uh, North, northern Greece, uh, to be uh, allowed uh, to Palestine because the Germans wanted to exterminate them. Uh, to which uh, uh, there was again discussion between Eden and uh, uh, Cordell Hall. Uh, Eden uh, uh, made the remark that uh, the whole problem of the Jews in Europe is very difficult and that we should move very cautiously about offering to take all Jews out of a country like Bulgaria. If we do that, uh, then the Jews of the world will be wanting us to make similar offers in Poland and Germany. Hitler might well take us up on any such offer, 
and there simply are not enough ships and means of transportation in the world to handle them. Eden said that uh, the British were ready to take about 60,000 more Jews to Palestine, but the problem of transportation, even from Bulgaria to Palestine, is extremely difficult. Furthermore, any such mass movement as that will, will be very dangerous to security because the Germans would be sure to attempt to put a number of their agents in the group. So that, that uh, proposal was uh, rejected. And uh, <coughs> when uh, another case, that is uh, an art, uh, article that appeared in the New York Times, it was uh, on February 16, 1943. According to the article, uh, the, Romania, the Romanian government was offering the Allies uh, Romanian ships to transport 70,000 Jews anywhere the Allies uh, wished. A departure tax to cover the transportation costs was all that was required. Both the US State Department and the British Foreign Office rejected this offer, fearing that it was a piece of blackmail unloading all their unwanted nationals on other countries. Uh, in the, the, the Allies. To Britain, Palestine was out of the question as a destination. The only way to help the Jews, the Allies maintained, was by an Allied victory. And then there was another attempt to, in the United States in 1939 to allow uh, 20,000 uh, children, Jewish children from Germany, to immigrate because the quotas didn't allow that many people to. Well, but uh, it was uh, sabotaged by restrictionist groups. And uh, the, all other attempts, like, uh, for example, uh, in that, as I believe that was in 1942, uh, there was a proposal to uh, open Alaska to immigration and uh, to accommodate the, the Jews that were already persecuted. Uh, but uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, put a limit of uh, 10,000 uh, people uh, per year, the most, and of those, uh, those 10,000, 5,000 uh, had to be Americans, and then uh, the, the remaining 5,000 from uh, other, all other countries of the world. And the Jews shouldn't exceed the 10% of that uh, 5,000. It's, it's, so it's uh, about uh, 500 people because it may uh, cause uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, issues in the United States. So the, uh, there, there are many uh, cases like that in the, the history that are not very uh, well publicized. As of uh, the, 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 the reappearing uh, statement that uh, the, the Allies didn't know enough about uh, what was going on, the, the real magnitude of the Holocaust. Uh, this is another issue uh, that, for example, in September 1942, uh, the President Roosevelt's ambassador to the Vatican, Myron C. Taylor, met uh, Pope uh, Pius XII and uh, presented him with a letter from uh, Roosevelt. And in that letter, in several paragraphs, it was uh, the, uh, described the liquidation, the brutal liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto, which means that they, they knew uh, the, what was uh, happening. So uh, I don't know if you can call this uh, revisionism, but it just simply uh, presents uh, facts in a way that uh, uh, make uh, the role of the uh, great powers uh, to look much more important than uh, it, it was uh, it actually was, and th this is the we should always remember because uh, you are all familiar with the uh, slogan "Never again." But uh, if you say "Never again," it is important to uh, know exactly what happened and how to avoid it from happening again, and. Uh, uh, that use of uh, ideology and uh, uh, different agendas is not helping. Uh, for example, the, it was uh, last year, in the summer, we uh, visited Poland and uh, Auschwitz. 
it, it was very interesting to listen to uh, the guide who uh, used that uh, to, uh, presentation by, to promote the European agenda for open borders. He said that uh, uh, Auschwitz, the place where so many Jewish refugees were uh, sent, and we have to open our hearts and our borders to other uh, refugees, which uh, is uh, very, very uh, uh, it, it doesn't show the real picture. The majority of the Jews who died in Auschwitz have lived in Europe for centuries. They were just uh, picked up by force and killed there. So when you uh, use that to, uh, to, to promote some questionable practices that uh, uh, may or may not improve the situation in Europe, uh, we should be very, very careful and not uh, try to exploit the Holocaust for the current uh, agenda. So that's all, all I want to say. Thank you.